Good morning. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share with you the beautiful people of Westminster Presbyterian Church. On behalf of Wake Forest University School of Divinity, where I have the privilege of serving as Dean, I want to thank you all for your incredible support. Craig and Martha Seiler offer their beautiful spirits of grace, humor, and kindness to us on our Board of Visitors. Jasmine Evans tells us that her experience with you this summer has been a wonderful learning and service opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Pastor Thompson, for this opportunity to celebrate grace, to follow Jesus, and hear and thus be healed by God's word. In Genesis, the 28th chapter, it says that Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place, stayed there for the night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. My friends, have you ever, as the saying goes, felt stuck between a rock and a hard place? It's when life finds you landed between two undesirable options. It's when circumstances have seemingly conspired to create a proverbial catch-22. If life were, let's make a deal, the game show, your choices would seem to be tragedy behind curtain number one or go home with an envelope of catastrophe a rock and a hard place. Such dilemmas emerge in varying contexts for a myriad of reasons. There are times when it's a result of our own actions or inactions, poor decisions, selfish choices, immoral compromises. Each has a way of damning our options. We've all been there. Who among us has not recited that prayer? A prayer that I like to think of as the prayer of the self-inflicted fool. God, if you get me out of this one, I promise I'll never do it again. A rock in a hard place. Sometimes we're making choices under conditions not of our own choosing. It's the way life has been stacked against us, often due to structural and systemic realities. It's what social theorists call a double bind. Ask any working woman in a range of professions today. Society's gendered social cues often feel asphyxiating. Act feminine so that you'll come off as likable, though that not necessarily capable. Or act masculine so that you'll come across as competent while being judged unfairly as callous. Women know what it means to be between a rock and a hard place at work. Ask millions of gifted students from impoverished and working class backgrounds. They understand that a college education open up, opens up doors of opportunity. It grants a key to cultural capital. So one pursues an education so that we can receive training and credentials for a better paying job and social networks. But due to the exorbitant amount of college these days, one commences their career saddled under the debilitating weight of increasing student debt, a rock and a hard place. Or ask an African-American driver what it feels like to be pulled over by the police. One's mind begins to rehearse the multitude of actions, interpretations, and conclusions that race and space might signify at any given moment in this nation. You start thinking, well, my parents taught me to move slow, keep my hands up, and remain deferential. Yet if I move too slow and deferential, they'll say I'm acting suspiciously. That's a rock in a hard place. Well, this Sunday's lectionary reading introduces us to somebody who knows something about this dilemma. He's between a rock and a hard place, quite literally. 
It's the Hebrew patriarch Jacob. He's third generation within a sacred lineage that began with his grandparents, Abraham and Sarah. Then it moved on to his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, who gave birth to Jacob after his elder brother Esau. Jacob is what we might call a child of entitlement. He's the favorite child of his mother, Rebekah. She pampers and privileges him. She coddles and cossets him. So much so that one might describe Jacob as imprudent at best and a spoiled brat at worst. In fact, Jacob came to be known in sacred history as a brazen and deceptive trickster. One who's willing to use whatever he has to get whatever he wants. Jacob the trickster. This is the same Jacob that swindled his elder brother Esau out of his birthright with a meager bowl of soup. This is the same Jacob that kept fanning the flames of deception and duplicity. The same Jacob that preferred the game of mendacity and manipulation over honesty and integrity. The same Jacob that ultimately conspired with his mother to deceive his father into receiving the blessing that belonged rightfully to his older brother. So when Esau discovered that Jacob had tricked him once again, he could not control his rage and contempt. He set his eyes on getting revenge on his younger brother. And so their mother, Rebecca, once again intervenes. She instructs Jacob to depart from their home in Beersheba to go stay with his uncle in Haran. And these are the circumstances that set up this scene in chapter 28 in today's lectionary. Jacob, he's about 60 miles into his journey, passing through a city called Luz. He's on the run. The hot sun had been descending down upon him all day in route. He's fatigued, he's alone, and he's afraid. So he picks up a rock. He places it down in a spot to act as a pillow. And with the consequences of greed and deception on his trail and a rock under his feet, Jacob is literally between a rock and a hard place. Well, I think all of us can learn a lesson from Jacob today. I think our nation might learn something from Jacob. It's not that Jacob wasn't a religious man. It's not that he didn't possess a particular form of piety. It's not that he didn't have a concept of God, but rather it's about what God Jacob worshiped. He had come to worship over the years, the unholy trinity of me myself and I. Likewise, the question for us is not whether we worship a God. It's a matter of identifying and interrogating the God that we worship. Because for too many of us, like Jacob, the God we worship is ourselves. As theologian Reinhold Niebuhr put it, it's a religion as old as humanity, the religion of self-glorification. So my friends, think with me, what happens? What happens when we mistake God's image in us for us being God? What happens when we mistake our creative capacity for God's originative expanse? What happens when you and I mistake our intellectual and reasoning ability for God's omniscient wisdom? We lose sight of our finitude. We become deluded by our own sense of grandeur. We place too much trust in our own limited capacity and we avail ourselves to the myth of our own meritocracy. We recite the concluding lines of William Ernest Henley's Invictus. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Until we aren't. Until 
until life's circumstances teaches us a harsh lesson about our mortal limits, until a tragic reality helps us to realize that there are just some things that are beyond our control in life, until we get stuck between a rock and a hard place and we can't figure our way out. Like a global pandemic, a global pandemic that has revealed the racial and class inequities and resultant health disparities that we have been so quick to sweep up under the rug of American prosperity and a booming stock market. A global pandemic that has inverted what we mean by essential worker in this nation. Custodians, grocery store attendants, elder care nurses, and other frontline health care workers, those to whom we are so often dismissive, have proven to be indispensable to those of us with shelter in place privilege. COVID-19 has shown us that there's no such thing in this nation as menial work. There's only menial pay. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the arbitrary nature of items, objects, and occupations that we have so much held and deemed as sacred. And it's forced us to recognize the folly of placing profits over people. The God of self-glorification is not the way. This is why the cross of Christ is so important for me today. For like Jacob's dream, a dream that reveals both the transcendent power and intimate eminence of God, the cross calls us to humility and repentance. The cross that held the body of Jesus reminds us of the tragic nature of unbridled power. It reminds us of our predilection to injure others. And it reminds us of the human penchant for injustice. The cross calls us to look with suspicion upon all of the socially privileged parts of our identity that we love to make sacred. Our Americanness our whiteness, our Protestantism, our wealth, our educational attainments. And the cross calls us to repent, to repent of the idolatry and tricksterism that can leave us out in the cold with a rock as our pillow. For when you and I humbly kneel before this cross, we can take the confounding questions and the inimical circumstances of life and rest them at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, who is our hope. For it's, it is Christ's love. It's Christ's compassion. It's Christ's call to justice that must serve as our sure foundation in this time of trouble. So even when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, we can cry out, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. between hope and a hard place.